Broadcast Network, After Buzz TV. Over 20 million weekly downloads in over 150 countries, and your number one source for after show entertainment. <laughs> TV, the destination for TV superfans, producing after shows for over 300 of your favorite TV shows, interviewing celebrities and showrunners, and bringing you behind the scenes exclusives. All thanks to E Entertainment's Maria Menunos, producer Kevin Undergaro, and internet leader Akamai. Now, let the buzz begin! Hey there, AfterBuzz TV fans. Welcome to another edition of Creators and Showrunners. I'm your host, Megan Salinas, and... And I'm Katie Cullen. Hi, all my buddies. And we are here with a very, very special guest today. Joining us in the studio is Jeff Klein. Nice to be here. Thank you. Well, Jeff... Good to have you here. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Well, producer, writer, story developer, is there anything you don't do? Uh, I don't dance. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, we're not going to ask you to do that today, so... No worries. I don't think it's any secret. Katie and I are actually really, really big fans of your work. So we are extremely excited to have you in the studio That's very today. Nice. Thank you. So, yeah, again, thank you for, so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. And we are listening to you guys on Twitter as well. If you guys would like to join in on the conversation, we're streaming live right now. Uh, we will be keeping an eye on Twitter for uh, using the hashtag creators. So if you guys have any questions for Jeff, uh, be sure to let us know. We will be keeping an eye on that hashtag. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to AfterBuzz TV on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, all that stuff. Leave a comment, rate us all that jazz. Anywho, let's get to it. So, Jeff, you're originally from Boston. I am. Why did you want to come out to California and be in the, and be in the entertainment industry? Uh, I was actually one of those lucky kids who had a pretty good idea of what they wanted to do from a pretty young age. So um, I sort of always expected I would work my way west. Uh, we actually had a TV studio in my middle school and a TV studio in my high school that I got to work in. Um, I went to college in Boston and then right after graduation, moved out here, uh, helped by the fact that my girlfriend at the time was also from out here, so I didn't actually make the move <laughs> Would have been a little scary to do that. So you, know ve you knew very, very young that storytelling was what you wanted to do. I really did, and luckily I had parents who uh, didn't think that was crazy. So. <laughs> did that you helps. have? Yeah, it really does. It's good to have supportive parents. <laughs> um, did you have a eureka moment? Like, was there any moment in particular, or is it just something that kind of grew on you? I think it more grew on me. If there was anything like a eureka moment for me, it was um, the first couple of years that I was here, I was working, uh, reading scripts. Uh, I was an assistant and a low-level development executive at a production company. And um, I found that I was actually bored. That like in the feature world, not, things didn't happen fast enough. And I'd actually prior to that been um, a newspaper reporter for a couple of papers in upstate New York. Uh, so I liked the idea of six o'clock deadlines. I liked the idea of you do it, you go crazy, you get it done, and then you can look at it the next morning, um, and it starts all over again. So after a couple of years in features, right around when the writer's strike happened and I was out of work, I started talking to some friends and saying, you know, I, this isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. I don't really know. And a couple of them said, well, you may want to try television because it tends to operate much more. Like Every day something is getting on that air, whether it's yours or not. Uh, and there's deadlines and constant decisions, uh, and they were right. I've, I've, I've worked in features as well, but I've been predominantly in television for the last 25 plus years. So you like the chaos and the constant deadlines? I do. I don't know. The chaos, I'm not so sure <laughs> I like. When I was younger, I probably liked it better. Um, but I do like the deadlines. I do like the fact that something is going to happen. Um, somebody is going to fill that time slot on ABC at 8 o'clock or on Cartoon Network or whatever it is, uh, and it may as well be me. Um, and it's not the kind of thing that, well, we'll talk about it endlessly and it may never happen. If you're going into production on TV, you're, you're going to, especially with animation, um, which I've done a lot of, um, once you push a button, it's pretty rare to pull the plug halfway through <laughs> on something animated because you've already done so much of the work up front. Uh, I have had the experience in live action primetime where you pull a plug a couple of episodes in. Um, but in animation, once it's going, you're probably going to get at least that first year out of it. And it's really nice because you know you're going to work with that group of people for at least a year or so, and hopefully for much longer. Is that because animation has to be done so far in advance? That's definitely part of it. Um, the most expensive part of doing an animated series is up front. It's all those initial designs, all those initial builds if you're doing CG. Um, so in some ways, it doesn't really save a lot of money to pull the plug halfway through. And a lot of times, 
uh, the toy licenses, the master toy licenses, which were tied um, uh, to getting the show ordered, the advances and such, um, require that you be on the air and you do a certain number of episodes. International requires that you do a certain number of episodes. So um, I'm sure it happens. It has not happened to me, but uh, I, have not, I have not worked on an animated series that didn't at least get through its initial order. So do you think that working in animation is more difficult than working in live action because there is so much more that goes into the, the pre-production? Or do you kind of find that more comforting? Uh, you know what, I don't think either is more difficult than the other. And I actually think there are more similarities between them than differences. Um, but there's definitely some things that are unique to animation, which can be a challenge. Um, but also some really nice things like uh, in animation, you can, you can keep changing it almost until the last second. Uh, and you can do some of that in live action, but it gets harder. And I think uh, in live action, when you're doing an eight-day shoot, you tend to back up on yourself faster. Um, but in animation, uh, especially if you can plan ahead, and if you're doing 26, you're sort of forced to plan ahead in a way that I don't think most live action is allowed to. Um, when you're doing live action, I feel like you need to, in some ways, be a little more reactive to the audience. So when, you're, when you have an episode running in live action, if the audience really isn't responding to a character, you tend to write less of them in upcoming episodes. In animation, often the way that the production schedule works and, and the way it's gonna air, you've already committed to your 26. <laughs> you know, you've made decisions you're hoping people are going to enjoy. Um, so there is definitely some freedom in that. There's a, a freedom in knowing that you're gonna get to the end point, because maybe in live action you had a plan that would have been really great if you could have gotten there, <laughs> but the audience is just not taking that ride with you. So you can change and react, whereas animation, you have to kind of stick to your guns a little Typically. bit. Typically. I mean, obviously, there are primetime animated shows that work much more up against the clock. South Park, the most obvious <laughs> yeah. example. Um, and, and you definitely do things, small things along the way in animation. But most of the time, you're reacting to the audience in between seasons as opposed to within a season. So which do you prefer working in, live action or animation? Um, that's a great question, and again, it's gonna sound like I'm copying out. I don't have a preference. <laughs> what I will say is, for whatever reason, I've been much more successful in animation than I have in live action. Um, and so for me, live action tends to be the thing that has a lot of run up and a lot of excitement, and then for whatever reason, nobody watches. Um, whereas when I do, and, and you, you fall in love and you become a family with all these people you work with, and then a year in or whatever it is, you're yanked apart from each other and, and you have to say goodbye. Um, Again, for whatever reason in animation, I've had shows that have run five years, six years. I've had a five and a half year run at Hasbro with the three different Transformers series. So there's something very nice about having that core family that you get to work with, even if it's across multiple series and, and some people change, but the core doesn't change. Um, and I found that I really like that, especially because this last go around, I actually live in, on the East Coast. I moved back to the East Coast in 2008. So when I first came out here to start up that Transformers Prime, I really thought it was going to be for a pretty limited amount of time. I'd get it going, I'd start a studio, and then I'd probably try to start dialing it back. But I ended up being here um, two or three weeks out of every month. And I ended up working with a core crew that I had worked with over the last 20 years or so on various series. So there's something incredibly familiar and comfortable about when I'm not with my actual family, my blood family, I'm here with my surrogate family. Well, and since you guys have worked together for so long, you know you can trust them when you have Absolutely. to go away. And that's a huge part of any production is, you know, there's no way for any one showrunner to do it all. Um, you can't even pretend. I don't draw particularly well. So I'm definitely not going <laughs> to be the guy who's doing expression sheets and, uh, and storyboards. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a real shorthand with me and Dave Hartman, who's our supervising director, or me and Therese Trujillo, who has been my animation producer on a number of series. Um, and technology allows me to be back east regardless to some degree. It's, it's, there's very little I can't do from there. Um, but even the little things I can't do, I know, are being taken care of by Dwayne Capizzi and Dave, wh whoever it is. That's good. And you also said two of our favorite words, Transformers yeah. Prime. <laughs> now, again, huge fan of the show. Very it's nice absolutely fantastic. Not only is it one of the best animated shows I've seen in the last couple of years, it's one of the best shows I've seen, period. And I think that yep. has a lot to do with what you were talking about from the writing perspective, the fact that you have to stick to your guns and that you have to have a plan through all of those 26 episodes. Be beyond the 26, I mean, we had a plan, almost every series I've done, we've had a plan for three years. Whether we get to that point or not depends on uh, the marketplace, but um, there was a lot of figuring out to do at the beginning of Prime. Wasn't a whole lot of time to do it, but there was a lot to do because we got 
we got a document from Hasbro that was literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of mythology and rules, some of which actually contradicted <laughs> itself. Can we see that? Like the actual you know, Bible, exist, actually. There's, there's like, like the watermark version it. with my name that I can't give you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, that's both incredibly helpful because it gives you this really rich mythology. It's also can be somewhat limiting if you have to keep to exactly what's in there. Um, so a lot of the time was spent picking and choosing and negotiating uh, uh, with, uh, with history, basically. Can we change this? Can we tweak this? Can we move this? Um, so we had to very quickly get up and going because I came out uh, in the fall of 2009, and we had to be on the air by fall of 2010. Oh, dang. Um, the Hub was premiering, <laughs> and we were going to premiere in October. Uh, I think it was 10, 10, 10, if I remember correctly. So really, for a CG series, you should have a year and a half for production, and probably should have had at least six months of development time, but we had just over a year to get on the air. Um, so one of the nice things that happened on Prime, uh, by design, but you know, I wish I had this luxury on every show, we had a full-time writing staff. It was the only way we could possibly get it going. So Dwayne Capizzi was the head writer, but he had four other full-time writers on staff um, who were literally working like a primetime series, sitting in a room all day, breaking story, we made the decision to do continuing storylines, so you've really got to plot that stuff out ahead of time and down the line and make sure. And, and things change, and you always burn through story much faster than you thought you would. Um, but I don't think there's any way Prime gets on the air a year later uh, if we didn't actually have a full-blown writing staff like a primetime series. No. It, like, watching the first couple episodes, I would have never guessed that you guys had that short amount of time to work on yeah, it. I like deadlines, like I said. <laughs> You wouldn't be able to tell it's such high quality. Well, that, you know, again, um, a lot of that is pre-production. It's planning. Um, and then it's also our sister studio. We have, we have, you know, 60, 70 people in-house who do all the character designs and storyboards and color and, 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 and a lot of details. But ultimately, the actual physical animation, the computer animation happens at a studio in Japan called Polygon that Dave Harper and I both worked with before on a Winnie the Pooh series. And they're fantastic. Um, they're the best. So um, there was a real comfort level with them. There was already a bit of a shorthand with them. And quite honestly, what we gave them, I think, was good. We gave them good storyboards. We gave them really good scripts and performances. They plussed everything. They, we would every, every so often get something back, and they would have just made some little improvement to it. Um, little character stuff like um, uh, there's a moment. They, they, in Japan, they fell in love with Miko. Uh, the, character Miko, the, the studio yeah. fell in love with Miko. So we, we'd say, you know, it takes her five seconds to cross a room, and we get back 50 seconds of Miko <laughs> doing a dance and a pirouette and a thing and a cross. But every once in a while, you get something just fantastic in her expression and the way she communicated non-verbally. Um, and that happened consistently with them. They're also involved in Robots in Disguise, which is the new uh, Transformers series premiere on Cartoon in March. And, um, and again, top themselves. It's a different kind of series. It's a 2D, 3D hybrid, but they really gone to a place that I'm not sure uh, daytime animation at least has gone before. Now what was the impetus for the style change between Prime and Robots in Disguise? Um, it was mostly two things. One, budget, um, which tends to always be why you make production decisions. <laughs> um, but even more than that, I think in doing Prime, both within the group that was doing Prime and for the fans, there was some frustration that we could only have so many characters. Um, because we're an all CG show, you know, we were limited to the number of builds. We were limited in the number of locations we could go to. So as, as happy as I am with Prime, and as much as I wanted it, and Dwayne Capizzi, we all wanted it to be about a small group who had to take on a much bigger uh, uh, foe, I think the idea was when we do it again, it'd be really nice if we could have a lot more characters and go some more places and have access to more of those classic Transformers characters maybe, um, or create new ones, um, which is, we've done both of those in the new Robots in Disguise. Um, so... Uh, what started as maybe more of a budget decision actually lent itself to growing the ensemble, which was really nice. Oh, necessity right. is the mother something. of invention. Yeah, that's yes. the word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the phrase you forget? <laughs> it's been a long day. But um, that's something not only with, one of the things that stands out about Prime is that it's not afraid to go dark. And I've noticed that a lot of your shows actually do that. It's not just limited to Prime. Have you ever had to fight with a studio to keep something in because they went too far? Or are they normally more supportive of all the creative choices? I don't think any studio is going to be supportive of all the creative choices. <laughs> um, I, don't think that, I, don't, I don't think that's in their charter. Um, I will say that Hasbro and, and very much so the Hub were very supportive of the direction we want to take Prime in. Um, the directive we were given at the beginning by Hasbro was that 
you know, this generation of TV viewers was more familiar with the features than they were with the, the 80s TV series or any of the Japanese ones that came after it. So in some ways, we were trying to give them an experience that felt familiar to that. Um, but obviously, I mean, for at least for my purposes, those movies to me are not appropriate for a seven or eight year old or a six year old. Um, and we wanted to be a little more appropriate for younger viewers, obviously, and bring them into the world of Transformers. Um, but we made the decision that as it gets harder and harder to hold on to those kids as they turn 9, 10, 11, because they go off into organized sports and video games and all the rest of it, that we were going to do some adulty things, but never in a way, hopefully, that would leave them behind. So, um, you know, we walked that line on Prime. I know some people feel like we may have gone too far at times. Um, for us, the big issue was if we're going to do things like war, which was a core part of this Transformers universe and that mythology, and the idea of death and even redemption, then it had to have consequences. We weren't just going to do it where a character dies in an episode, and the next episode nobody's talking about it and nobody's <laughs> mourning. That's um, the worst. Oh, my god! Because that then suggests to a five, six, seven, eight-year-old, whatever it is, that death has no consequences, <laughs> or you know, which in some ways is a weirder message to send. Um, so, uh, so that's why we have episodes where characters are actually mourning or pining or whatever. Um, and that's why in the very first episode, we killed Cliff Jumper, and then just so you knew he was really dead, we turned him into a zombie, and, <laughs> and then we chopped him up into little pieces. He was super dead. He was really super dead. Because Transformers, historically, in all kids' fantasy, often characters die and come back. And, but that's and, Optimus's job. No. Yes, exactly. 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 So, um, you know, in, in Rescue Bots, obviously, which I also did a very, very different demographic, a very, very different kind of series, got rid of war altogether. There's nothing to do with <laughs> yeah. war. As, you know, we're saving people, but I'm going to get spoiler. We save everyone. Everybody, <laughs> everybody, everybody is saved. Everybody lives. Um, Robots in Disguise will walk a little more of a line. It's definitely an in-between show. It's between Rescue Bots and Prime. Um, so the idea is, again, bring in some younger viewers, have them grow up with the franchise. They become the people who go to see the movies, um, but, but uh, give them an entry point. It feels appropriate to So basically, this new series is to sucker everyone into a false sense of security before you rip our hearts out. There, there may be things that happen. There may, maybe. Be, there may be things maybe. that happen. But I'm not sure we will chop anybody up into little pieces. <laughs> I hope not. Little six-year-olds watching it going, this doesn't happen in Rescue Bots. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. It would be a very different show. Uh, but you mentioned earlier that you're not you're not an artist. You don't like drawing a bunch of characters. It's not that I don't like it. It's that I'm very, very bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I can empathize. Um, but I, a lot of the shows that you worked on have had great character design. So yes. I wanted to know how involved you were in that process. Is it something that you just kind of let the creators do their things and then approve? Or is it something where you make suggestions? No, I, I, I can't speak for all showrunners, obviously, in animation, but I tend to be very involved, which doesn't mean that I'm dictating, because Jose Lopez, for example, who did the character designs on Prime and, uh, and Robots in Disguise, um, he, we had worked together on Sony shows over the years, so I had a lot of uh, immediate faith in him. Um, so I knew I could let him on his own. Um, but that doesn't mean that we didn't spend a lot of time up front talking about who are these characters, what do we want from them, what do we want their physical reputation, rep representations to suggest about their personalities. Um, you know, he'll, he talks about, um, uh, about how uh, I, I wanted um, Starscream to feel like a snake <laughs> and how he kept showing me designs and it just wasn't working for me. And then he finally did one where he basically put an image of a, co of a snake over the design. And I was like, yeah, that's it. You know? <laughs> He's very proud of himself for pulling one over on me, but that is what I was looking for. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, Jeff Matsuda did a bunch of stuff for us before. Um, I, I do tend to go back to some of the same people, um, but I find it's really have as much upfront conversation as you can. Have a lot of in-depth conversation. Keep the dialogue going. This is not a situation... You know, an animation crew works best when everybody can talk to everybody. When an artist, a character designer, come in and talk to a writer or talk to a director or talk to a board artist. A lot of animation... Um, for, for all kinds of reasons, is done a little bit more segmented. It's, you know, the writer hands off a script and is basically out of the process. Um, the storyboard artist may never talk to anybody while they're doing their storyboards or maybe just to their director. Uh, it's really important for me on all the shows I've ever worked on that everybody's in the room, everybody's in, on the floor. So, you know, we took over a floor of an office building when I had G.I. Joe and Transformers going simultaneously. We had about 100 people 
and those shows would cross over. My, I was my happiest when someone on Prime would have a, would be stuck with something and he'd wander into somebody over on G.I. Joe and say, can I bounce this off you? And the writers would be bouncing stuff. I mean, that's, that's what you want. You want, it does actually take a village to do these things. And if you can, you know, get two villages working together, even better. So a lot of these guys, have you, you said you've worked with them for a bunch of years yeah. now. Um, were they involved in Godzilla and Extreme Ghostbusters, yes. Jackie? So Chantis? that Sony group, where that, and my first animation was at Sony, we all came up together. Um, and then everybody went off and did other things. A lot of them went to Warner Brothers for those in-between years. I brought Dave Hartman back with me at Disney to do a Winnie the Pooh series. Um, but when it was going to be the beginning of Prime, when we were going to start up an in-house studio to, get it, to make it work uh, and get it done, it was basically my chance to call everybody and say, I'm putting the band back together. <laughs> yeah. you know, do you want to come? And honestly, I was amazed at how many people came. Um, from Vince Toyama, as I said, to Jose and Dave and Therese and Dwayne, Steve Melching, Marsha Griffin. I mean, it really, um, it, it really was amazing how many people had sort of missed that camaraderie in some way um, and, and had good experiences elsewhere, but it wasn't quite the same. And, um, you know, it's five and a half years on, more or less, and most of that core group is still at Hasbro. That's fantastic. Yeah. Can you keep that group together and just keep doing awesome things like that? Um, <laughs> my hope is they will stay together. I unfortunately um, uh, realized at the end of last year that it was time to go back to my family because it had been five and a half years. And if you watch the Super Bowl, you know that every commercial was about what a bad father I've been, <laughs> basically. You know, if it wasn't cats in the cradle, it was a dead kid in the bathtub. So, oh um, so I literally kind of went, I, I, maybe I need to be home more. Um, so they are together. Uh, working on season two right now of Robots in Disguise. Um, my hope is they stay together and that they do a lot more shows for Hasbro, but you never know. Here's hoping, because you yeah. put together one hell of a team. I agree. I agree. And my goal, my, my dream would be to work with them all again uh, in some other, you know. If I can find someone who will let me do a show from the East Coast, uh, I'd be very Not that the crew has to be there, but if I could just come out here for maybe a week a month or a week, a couple weeks every couple months, that'd be fantastic. Well, that's why Skype exists. <laughs> yeah, technology is, it, it actually, there's very little requirement other than there are times where you want to be face-to-face, -face, no question. But um, as far as doing the job day-to-day, -day, um, I think it's more of a fear that it hasn't been done that way and a little bit of the executives, the companies tend to be based in Los Angeles and so for the sake of, you know, their own sanity or control, <laughs> um, they like having it all right there. But there'll be something, there'll be something that comes up, I hope, where, you know, my crew can be in LA, I can be there. We use you know, freelance artists from all around the country, or even sometimes around the globe. Um, so uh, uh, there's no reason everybody has to be together, but there are advantages to having everybody together, no question. It definitely helps. Now, speaking of that, what do you tend to look for in a story when, when you're, you're in the initial planning processes? What draws you to a particular project? Um, I, I've, I've been asked this question before in different ways, and I feel like, and so I actually tried to think of a good answer. Um, and if I go back and look at almost every series I've done, whether I realize it or not, it is somehow about um, creating family. Um, from Extreme Ghostbusters to Jumanji to the Transformers shows. And again, I'm not sure that's a unique thing, you know, exclusive to my series, but that does seem to be a very recurring theme. Um, and it tends to be a bunch of mismatched, pe mismatched people um, who sort of have to forge together for whatever reason, Godzilla. Uh, uh, usually with at least one wild card, Godzilla. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and they end up creating a sort of de facto family as a result. Um, so, again, I don't know how conscious that is, but that obviously is something I am drawn to. Um, similarly, m as with all television, it's largely about character. If you can get a handle on who these people are, then you feel like you have a handle on the show. Um, one, of the, one of the rare exceptions to that for me, or not necessarily an exception, but with Rescue Bots, um, because we were doing another Transformers show while we were all still doing Prime, and uh, tonally it was going to be very different, but I was trying to find a different way into it. Um, again, with this sort of a genuine family, they're actually our blood related, but there's still this extended family of the bots who come to Earth and work with them. Um, but I couldn't really get a handle on it until, uh, I think it was Mike Vogel at Hasbro actually said to me, well, if you could do anything, what would you want to do with it? And I said, well, I want to set it in Maine, <laughs> and I want to have the robots have, nothing, have no knowledge of what's going on in America because then they're going to know there's a war and they should probably be fighting it because <laughs> crime is happening concurrent. So I want to put them on an island 
And on that island, I want to have crazy technology because I always liked that part of big guy. And I feel like that, and that's what became Rescue Bots. So until I got that handle on it, I was having a hard time figuring out. And then Brian Holfeld and Nicole Dubuque just ran with it and did, and, and Greg Johnson did amazing work on it. You basically put them in the setup for a Stephen King novel <laughs> and made it a kid show. Yes. <laughs> that's amazing. Yes. Yes. Well, as a kid, you loved horror, didn't you? I mean, no. Really? <laughs> no, I'm terrified. Horror. I mean, I feel like goose my daughter's obsessed with Goosebumps and those kind of shows. Oh, yeah. I was a big Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps. Yeah. It scared me, but it right. didn't stop me from watching it. I'm it scared complete... me, and that did stop me. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. It's not for everyone. I grew up on Twilight Zones on Channel 9 in New York, thanks to cable, and, you know, at 11 o'clock at night when I shot, should have been asleep because um, I had school the next day. But um, very much Twilight Zone influenced everything I've ever done. So. If I can do anything like a Twilight Zone for kids, I'll be very happy. <laughs> you keep answering my questions before I ask them. Oh, really? Because <laughs> a lot of your properties are adapted properties. Yeah. So I was going to ask, what would you adapt? And we just got that answer. Oh, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> um, you know, what's amazing is I've gotten to work on a whole bunch of properties that I did grow up. Like, I, I grew up on banana splits. And a few years ago, I actually got to do a whole bunch of web shorts, which was just fantastic. I, to get to revisit your own childhood in that way is fantastic. And I didn't grow up on Transformers. I'm a generation before it. So, you know, Monkeys reruns and Twilight Zone reruns and Banana Splits. Um, but I understand that passion. And, you know, a lot of the people working on the Transformers series did grow up on those shows. Um, and they feel very beholden to the franchise and ultimately to the audience. And I do think that shows. And again, we're never, you're never going to make everybody happy. Um, there's no way. Um, and in animation, you are guessing ahead by a year, basically. You know, you're, you're not as, a, as flexible as you could be in a live action series. Um, so you really do have to commit to it. I think you mentioned that earlier and, and really just believe that they'll eventually come around or they won't and you'll just have to live with that. Um, and we've been fortunate that for the most part, those who didn't start with us at least found something to like in the various Transformers series. Well, there's a lot to like. If you build it, hopefully <coughs> they'll come yeah. and seems like they've come in droves. They, they have, uh, which we really appreciate, believe me. Besides Twilight Zone, what else inspires you? Um, I used to watch a ton of Star Trek reruns. Um, honestly, uh, I, read, I read five or six newspapers every weekend, um, and I find that a lot of story stuff comes from that, uh, uh, especially on Rescue Bots, like little technology things would based on a little story one of us ripped out of the newspaper or something. Um, I kind of feel like inspiration comes from everywhere. I'm a pretty big collector, hence Rescue Bots. Denny Clay lives <laughs> in what would be my dream, this enormous junkyard that's actually a collector's heaven. Um, and in general, I think you take stuff from your own life. You take relationships in your life, um, whether it's you know uh, parents, siblings. I have a brother. We tried to kill each other for most of our youth. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure brothers. that's changed. Yeah, it's most brothers, three years apart. Um, but I think you use all that and then um, one of the things that I, when I talk to younger writers, one of the things that I can't encourage them to do enough is be interested in other stuff. Don't just watch television and watch movies. That's sort of a secondhand knowledge. Actually go out and do stuff. It then becomes firsthand when you're writing it and it feels a lot more authentic and a lot less familiar, even if it's something that we've seen before. There's just something about it that, that, that feels more personal. And I think um, in television, especially because you're talking rather personally to an audience. It's often in their bedroom or in their kitchen or whatever, um, and you're leaning in and you're in close-up, the more personal it can feel, uh, uh, more authentic in some way, the better. Yeah. All right. I like that. It's more authentic, everything like that. Now, that being said, what do you think is the project, kind of just looking over everything you've done to, to date, what do you think is the project that's meant the most to you? Ay, ay, ay. It's like um, picking children. Yeah, it's hard because on My Friends Tigger and Pooh, I was able to name a character after my daughter. So that was kind of oh. nice. Darby, which is also Darby Pop, the production company. Um, and actually on Prime, it's the last name of the family, Jack Darby. Uh, but in some ways, maybe my favorite series, which will be a surprise to many, um, was, a, was a, a version of Harold and the Purple Crayon I did years cool. ago for HBO. Um, only because I had done Dragon Tales, but that was, you know, I hadn't done a whole lot of preschool prior to that. And Harold combined... A, f a beloved children's book um, with uh, Van Dyke Parks, who did all the music, which who was was amazing and who I had idolized. Um, and it was, it, it it doesn't have an obvious 
what do you do with them? I mean, the books are rather short and there's only been a few of them. Um, and for some reason, I just felt like that one came together in a way um, that was surprising even to me a little bit. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pretty proud of it. There's, there's no show I've worked on that I haven't actually been happy about. There's things I would go back and fix. There's little things, but in general, even Starship Troopers where we had insane production problems and we never actually got to finish the 40 episodes. We, Aww. I think we did 37 and three clip shows or four clip shows because we just ran out of money. Aww. We couldn't do the last. <laughs> um, so we actually never won the war. Sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> but, That's okay. Um, they didn't in the movie either. <laughs> but I look back at those, those shows fondly and I feel like for the most part they hold up, especially in, within their context. Um, but for whatever reason, How the Purple Crayon just, I'm, I watch it and I'm kind of surprised I did it. I don't know. Hmm. I was glad to hear that it worked out. Now, you mentioned that for the most part, you're very happy with all of your work, but you did mention that there were one or two things that you wish you could go back to. Oh, there's and always. <laughs> there's, oh, there's things as soon as you're done with the episode. There's things as soon as you record a script. There's, you always. There's that hindsight bias. There's always, always, always. Um, and again, one of the things I like about television is too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, because otherwise I am one of those people who would just keep playing with it and at some point you have to stop and walk away and <laughs> it lives and it exists and no matter how perfect it is it's never perfect so um, I like the deadlines of television but if you could reboot any one project Anything. that you've done what oh would a you new do? version of any one that yeah. I've done actually uh, all right I would definitely want to try Starship Troopers again with mm -hmm. the technology that exists today oh yeah because we were at that time cutting edge but the limitations were pretty uh, staggering um, and especially because again that core crew is a lot of the same guys who worked on Prime so could you imagine giving Starship Troopers to the Prime crew and the Prime writers um, those bugs would be oh terrifying my yeah. so that would, be, that would be I'm not sure it would be six year old appropriate but no that would be that would be a fun one um, I feel like Big Guy and Rusty never quite got its due it was um, I don't know if it was time slot or just it wasn't based on a really well-known property it was a comic book but not terribly well known um, but I feel like that's maybe the series that deserved a little more attention. So if rebooting it brought more attention to it, um, maybe that one. But um, I don't know. I've had, I've had a really good time doing the shows I've done. And for the most part, they've been reboots of existing franchises. So I've, I've gotten to rejigger <laughs> along the way. Um, sometimes, you know, for the better, sometimes for the worse. But I've, I've had an unusual opportunity in getting to go into this stuff and, and uh, for the most part, actually be able to work with the original creators or some of the original people and bring it uh, up to date and into a new place. So, Awesome. Well, you mentioned Darby Pop, and you also mentioned comics. Yes. So you're into pu com actually publishing comics now. Can About you... two years ago. Um, I grew up loving comic books. Um, obviously, a lot of the people we work with in animation are also, if not comic book fans, they're working in comics. They're <laughs> artists. They're doing uh, right. Adam Beechin, who's the head writer of Robots and, uh, Rescue Bots, does a lot of comic book work. Um, so I'm, I've been surrounded by it. And every so often, you know, you'll have an idea. For whatever reason, it's not going to work for TV or may not work for features. But, you know, oh, I'll be I think it could work as a comic book. Or you need to prove it could work. Um, but I've been in production, luckily enough, for you know, pretty steadily for the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, but about two years ago, I decided, you know what, I'm going to try this. I, it's something I can do from home, it's something I can do from the East Coast, uh, because all the artists are somewhere else. Um, and I'll just start with one book. I'll do my own idea. I'll write it. I'll hire artists. I'll, you know, I, I had a guy named David Wall help, who's a, an editor at a number of different companies over the years. And then I started talking to some other writer friends and telling what I was doing. And of course, every writer <laughs> has an idea that they've always wanted to do for comic books. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I well... I, you know, that's a good idea, too. I, maybe, we, maybe we could do that one. And so by the time I was done, I had kind of committed to five titles, so then I had to start an actual publishing company. <laughs> um, so we announced it at Comic-Con San Diego in uh, June or July of uh, 13, and the first book, Indestructible, first issue of my book, Indestructible, hit in December, and we've published, on average, about two books a month ever since, and we're up to, like I said, five titles and about 40-plus issues and trade paperbacks in the marketplace. Um, so that's been incredibly creatively satisfying and financially a disaster. <laughs> oh. uh, so um, I'm desperately trying to figure out how to make that, how to change that. Um, but comic books is a really hard business. Uh, there's, you know, five major players who control, and really two or three who control 
the bulk of the market. Um, 500 titles a month, which is probably just too many. Most stores are small. They, only, they can only order the top 200, let's say. How do you get people to hear about your original IP? It's one thing if you go and license Six Million Dollar Man or Twilight Zone or Godzilla, all of which are actually being published. Um, but if you're doing original IP, how do you get fans to hear about it, those who may walk in a store and request it, and how do you get a store to take a chance and order it, again, when there's 500 books coming at them every month? So it's, it's proven to be really challenging. I have a fantastic team uh, that I work with. Renee Geerlings is my managing editor, uh, and Josh Kozine, and, and, and a bunch of others. And we've got now a real nice in-house group of artists, because when we started, um, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this world by any means. Um, and what I found was a lot of times with comic book artists, because they don't get paid very well and they're juggling 10 jobs at a time, deadlines can be an issue. Um, so I ended up leaning on some of my animation guys because they're very used to deadlines. So Brandon McKinney, for example, who's been uh, one of our lead board artists on, on Prime all these years, uh, has drawn every issue of Doberman, which is one of our five titles, because I just needed somebody I knew would do it. And again, there's a shorthand and a little peccadillos I have that translate from animation to comic books. Not everything does, but some of my peccadillos do. Um, like, I don't like profile shots or whatever it is. <laughs> um, and Brandon knows that, so I don't get any of those. Um, but comic books has been, it's creatively incredibly satisfying, and it's really nice to not have a network and a studio and a toy company and rights holders <laughs> kind of telling you, but it is financially really a challenge. Um, so for every comic book creator out there or small press or whatever, believe me, I feel your pain. It's really, really hard to to survive and get attention in the marketplace. Well, you've actually touched on one of the biggest pain points of not just entertainment, but just art in general. Absolutely. How do you reconcile creativity and budget? Yeah, and in some ways, this microeconomy has helped uh, where everyone can be a part of it in some ways. But on the other side, it's really hard to make a living when everybody's getting pennies for their you know, Spotify songs or whatever it is. And, I don't, and Spotify's losing money, apparently, uh, in, the, in the hundreds of millions. So um, it's really hard. I mean, I think as, you know, as an artist, there's that one equation, which is it's all sweat equity. Anything you make on it is gravy. But if you have to pay bills, it's really hard to, to do that for long. Um, and and um, in some ways, you know, television hasn't been impacted by that as much. Uh, the audiences have shrunk to an incredible degree, but for some reason, budgets really haven't. On primetime series, budgets are in some ways higher than they've ever been. And ad dollars haven't changed. The ad rates haven't changed, even though the audience has gotten smaller and smaller, even on the major networks. Um, at some point, there will probably be a reckoning. Um, but until that comes right now, you know, television's still pretty good to the artists who work within it. Um, but publishing, much harder. You know, unless you're a celebrity with a book, how do you get your first novel published or get any attention anymore? Um, the gatekeepers have sort of gone away because there's, they, don't, they don't garner enough uh, 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 attention anymore. Um, not that that was not, you know, and the gatekeepers could keep you out, so it's better that now everybody can get in, in theory. But comics is still a pretty hard place to break into, and if you break into it on your own, you're left fighting with everybody else for attention, and it can be really, really hard. And, you know, no matter how a tra the Transformers show, Prime could have premiered and bombed for whatever reason. It didn't, luckily, but you know it was on a new network. They ended up doing a great job with it. Hasbro obviously promoted it incredibly well, um, but you never know, uh, and um, you're always afraid as an artist that it's your last job. So, uh, you know, I look, I look forward. I would think I came up at a time when it was hard to break into television, but once you broke in, you could work pretty consistently if you if you actually weren't just a jerk or. <laughs> Or not talented. If you um, could do the work. If you could do the work. I, I, in some ways, I think it's harder now. I think, I think more people break in because there's more shows. And um, uh, you can break in younger. And you can break in less experienced. But I worry that it's harder to maintain a long-term career. And that's just me speaking from television. I'm guessing you could talk to artists in a lot of the different arts. And it's the same thing. You know, just getting in now isn't enough to, to sustain. You, you know, you're going to be able to sustain for 10 or 20 years. Having spoken with friends who are trying to break into TV and art and animation, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, it's and uh, I don't really know what the answer is. You know, unfortunately, um, uh, again, it's a great time to be an animator. It's a great time to be an artist. Um, there's an incredible amount of work. There's more animation than ever before, um, and better quality. Um, uh, and in some ways, the overall bar being raised has made it less of a ghetto. You know, it's still the bastard stepchild of television, <laughs> but but less so. 
you guys are talking about Prime and you don't seem shamed in any way. That's um, because it's amazing. <laughs> and we have no shame. <laughs> Probably more the latter. I'm wearing Decepticon. <laughs> she is, by the way. You are, actually. <laughs> um, but it's a great time to be an artist, but it's a hard time, I think, to have a long-term career. It is, especially when everything, and it's great when it's project-based, but right. then that means you have to find the next project, yeah. with the, which is both fulfilling and kind of These scary. These are freelance lives. I mean, the one thing about working entertainment in any way, shape, or form, it's a freelance life. So if you don't like the idea of always having to look for your next job while you're still in your current job, <laughs> um, it's probably not the life for you. It just it really isn't. Well, unfortunately, we are running short on time. We have time for a few more questions. Katie, do you have anything Can we talk about robots in disguise? We can. Because I'm intrigued to see this come up. Um, are you basing anything in it off of the 2001 anime of the same name? I noticed that we have the animal-themed Decepticons. Right. Um, no, at least not consciously, which doesn't mean that there won't be things that will in some way resemble it, but not consciously. Um, ultimately, that was just, we always end up kicking around hundreds of titles, literally. Some won't clear, uh, some are just stupid, uh, <laughs> and ultimately Robots in Disguise is the one that really Hasbro wanted to go with. Um, so, uh, it, it, take it as a little bit of an homage to the past, but it's not really an update or a reboot in any way of that show. And this question actually comes from a friend. Will we have more female Transformers alongside Strongarm? Because I know there's been quite a call for that. Um, that's, really, that's always been really important to the core team behind Prime and beyond. Um, you know, historically, in what's considered boys' action, um, toy companies especially felt that if you had a female character, boys wouldn't buy the toy. Boo. Girls yeah. would buy boys' toys, or girls would watch boys. But boy, I, We've never believed that. Um, and I think RC on Prime has proven that because I, at one time at least, and I, I may be speaking, I believe she was the best-selling figure within Prime. I could be wrong. I'm going to stick to it, though. I'm gonna, she was the best-selling figure. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, and we had Marsha Griffin uh, and Nicole Dubuque and Margaret Scott um, all writing on Prime. Um, it was a, 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 a very gender-balanced uh, writing staff. Um, and so moving forward, I think because of the success of RC, um, some of those walls have come down a little bit. So on Robots in Disguise, you will absolutely see more female characters. Yes, that is exciting to hear. I kind of have an out of the blue question. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Transformers, but I know you worked on Jackie Chan Adventures. Yes. I was wondering just how involved he was in that show in particular. Or was he like, you guys just do your thing? No, he was actually more involved than I ever would have imagined. First of all, we had, I don't remember, we had live action wraparounds. Yeah. So I'd go out to Hong Kong and we'd shoot those. Those were filmed in Hong Kong? Those were filmed in Hong Kong. Wow. Um, he's so busy. Um, <laughs> and then when he'd come to the States and he'd come maybe to promote a movie or he'd come to do something else, he would always come in and we'd record a ton of sound effects with him or wallow or screams or certain dialogue that we knew we would be reusing. Um, he was amazing about doing some publicity for it. He really was. Uh, he'd show up to events. He was, he was great. He was really great. And, um, you know, in retrospect, it was, it was all happening so fast and I had a couple of shows going simultaneously. I don't think it quite hit me that he was the biggest movie star in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because of maybe a, a bit of a language, he speaks, he speaks English pretty well, but it's not his, obviously, his first language. You know, it's, move here! And, and I'm like, I just pushed around. The biggest movie star in the world, and he couldn't kick my ass! <laughs> but he was, uh, he was fantastic to work. That show was a pleasure. We, I think we did five years of that one. Yeah, I remember l really liking that one a lot when it was on. That was, again, a lot of the prime crew. Dwayne Capizzi had right. It's a lot of the same people. You know what? That makes a lot of sense. A lot of your crew has been responsible for most of our nostalgia. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Now, again, sadly, we are running short no on problem. time. Are there any upcoming projects that you can talk about, or is that still kind of under NDAs? Um, if I can, I'm going to take this opportunity to plug the comic books. So please go to your comic book retailer or Comixology, wherever you get your comic books, and ask for Indestructible, City the Mind of the Machine, The Seventh Sword, Doberman, and Dead Squad. Um, and... Um, you can get them in floppies. Most of them have trades or will have trades uh, within the next couple of months. Um, visit us at www.darbypop, D-A-R-B-Y, my daughter's name, P-O-P, dot com, all one word, Darby Pop. Uh, our Twitter is Darby Pop Comics. Um, we have an Instagram, although it's not terribly robust. We've got a Facebook. Please check us out. If you, if you read us and don't like something, I'm, you know, I, I'm sorry and, and I'll miss you, but I understand. <laughs> but 
I just need you to try. I just need you to check us out. So um, if, uh, if I can just make that call to arms, please uh, help Darby Pop Comics survive into the next, uh, the next year. Well, you've convinced me. I want to yeah. check it out. <laughs> a lot of, really, a lot of um, really talented TV and movie writers who, you know, one of the, one of the dings on comics is um, sometimes it's writers who want to be working in movies and TV who are sort of biding their time in comics. Um, these are movie and TV writers who don't need to buy their time. They're already in it, but want to do comic books. This is driven by people who want to do comic books. So, for example, um, Dead Squad is Fetterman Skaya, who we're doing right in the new Michael Bay video game movie right now. Um, or Eric Garcia, who did City of the Mind of the Machine, wrote uh, uh, Matchstick Men and Anonymous Rex and a bunch of other stuff. So, um, it's a, and Doberman is by guys who did It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> so a lot of really very different, but all kind of with an, with an idea of a big hook, big summer popcorn sort of stuff. Um, that's the concept behind Dark Pop. So this is a company of dream projects. Yeah, it, it is. It really is. It tends to be, you know, the, the, for whatever reason, the idea that wouldn't go away. It's the migraine you could not get rid of for <laughs> each of these writers. That's, and that's usually the best projects. Well, and it All sounds right. like you're hitting a lot of genres there. Try. So hopefully, hopefully that can turn around because I would love to just see movie adaptations of yes. these. I would too, but for now we're in the comic book business. <laughs> right. One step at a time. I'm going to go, go ahead and throw out one more fun question. Sure. Favorite Transformer? Oh, I don't know. I can't. They're all my children. <laughs> you know, if I pick one, then it's it's not just the character, but the actor. I'm going to get grief. Fair enough. I'm going to get grief from the actors because they get very committed to these parts. And um, one other little thing I'll say is, um, and if you've ever come to a con and seen us do a panel at San Diego or whatever, um, these casts do become surrogate families. I mean, they get incredibly close. We, re we record radio play style on all my shows, so everyone's in the room simultaneously uh, for four hours or less, you know, if we can do it. Um, so it really does become this, this family thing, and then they go out afterwards and everybody, you know, has meals or whatever. Um, so there is no way I can pick a favorite because <laughs> everybody will tell everybody and I will get endless crap for it. I had no idea you guys did group reads. That's fantastic. We all, I, I'm trying to think, on, I'm pretty sure on every show I've ever done, Richard Rainis did it that way, and he's who I, I learned from the most. Um, and it just gives you, you know, better stuff. Everybody's actually playing off of each other. If you have to, you'll do a one-off because someone's not available or whatever. But in general, if you can get everybody looking forward to being in that room once a week. Um, and for guest stars, nobody says no. <laughs> wear, wear your sweatpants. You don't have to memorize the lines, and you're coming into this really welcoming family who are happy to have you, but the pressure's not on you. You're a guest star. The pressure's on Peter Cullen. The pressure's on Josh <laughs> Keaton. The pressure's on whom, you know, Will Friedle. It's, it, it, um, it's not on you. Have fun with it. And, and it's amazing who'll come in just to do a guest part because it's actually a bit like going to acting school, I think. It's a little bit back to the days when you'd be in front of a class performing. You know. And what are they going to say? No, I don't want to be a giant robot? <laughs> Yeah, they could, but most don't. Most don't. I mean, obviously, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson let himself yeah. be killed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which still kind of cracks me up. Well, Jeff, thank you so much oh, for joining us today. Much. It was an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you. Again, if you want to throw your uh, social media out one more time. Please go, go to www.darbypop, D-A-R-B-Y-P-O-P.com or Darby Pop Comics on Twitter. Thank you so much. Katie Cullen, where can the people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Kiaxet. That's K-I-A-X-E-T. And I'm Megan. You can follow me on Twitter at The Manguin. That's T-H-E-M-E-N-G-U-I-N. -E -E Once again, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys. Keep watching. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.